Hi friends, I have been waiting weeks to share this conversation with Dr. Caitlin Moore all about vocal health for music teachers. Over the summer, Dr. Moore was able to take time out of her teaching schedule at the Interlochen Summer Arts Camp and uh, sit down with me to talk about all things vocal health, vocal fatigue, um, vocal mechanisms, and just so much more. This was a very practical episode, and I walked away with a lot of things that I could implement right away. I also think it's a really timely episode here in the first several weeks of the year um, when a lot of us can start to feel a little bit of that vocal fatigue start to set in. Two things before we jump in. Number one, you can use the link in the show notes to find more about Dr. Moore's background and read her bio. You can also find her contact information there if you want to reach out and share some of the takeaways that you got from this conversation uh, because she is a wealth of information about vocal pedagogy. And then the second thing is you can listen to this conversation with your podcast player, or you can also find it on YouTube if you want to watch the video. Okay. And with that out of the way, let's jump into this conversation with Dr. Caitlin Moore. My name is Victoria Bowler, and this is episode 73 of Elemental Conversations. All right, Caitlin, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay. So one of the things that I knew I was looking for this fall, I wanted to talk to someone who works with adults primarily. Um, and I also wanted to talk to someone who is not a soprano. And so I went through my brain and I was like, oh, I know a former soprano who can speak to this probably from like very many different angles. Right. So, um, can you tell us just a little bit about the work you do, uh, with, vocalists and maybe people who consider themselves like not to be great vocalists and and all of that. So tell us a little bit about about your current work. Yeah, so my official positions are instructor of voice at Colorado Macy University, instructor of voice at Interlochen Center for the Arts, and I also run a private studio um, both online and in person. Um, Yeah, and I freelance uh, as a mezzo-soprano both classically and, and across styles. Um, so I work with, at Colorado Mesa, I work a lot with college students. Um, there are some uh, non-traditional older college students there that I guess you would consider uh, m- more adult <laughs> than, than regular college students. And then uh, it's at Interlochen, I work with high schoolers. And then um, at, in my private studio, I have a lot of different uh, age groups, but primarily I work with adults in my private studio. Um, so yeah, that it, a lot of um, singer songwriters, uh, some adults that are coming back, they've always wanted to sing. And so uh, now they're, they're studying voice with me um, after having a career, maybe in nursing or, or something like that. Um, so that's, that's been a lot of fun um, to work with, with that population. Awesome. Love it. Okay. So Caitlin, give us, oh, and should I call you Dr. Moore? Are you a, are you a doctor or you are like very close or where are we in this process? Yeah, I am a doctor. You, you don't have, you can call me Caitlin. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, yes, I, I am celebrating that. I just, I just finished my degree. Uh, finally, my dissertation in, in May. So yay. Great. <laughs> um, people will be interested in this. Tell us about your, your dissertation. Cause this also ties in kind of to your own vocal journey as well. Absolutely. So my dissertation is, let's see if I can remember the title, Pedagogical um, Approaches and Considerations for Switching from Soprano to Mezzo-Soprano. So um, yeah, I was a soprano uh, when, when you knew me, Victoria, back in, back in undergrad. And then mm-hmm. um, I switched to Mezzo-Soprano for a variety of reasons um, when I was 30. So a little bit later, uh, you know, air quotes uh, yeah. in, in my career. Um, and yeah, there's a lot that goes with that, both uh, vocally and, um, you know, thinking about marketing and things like that. So I got to interview a ton of singers um, that had gone through that transition as well. Uh, some had metropolitan opera careers um, and, and made that transition. And then I uh, got to interview a lot of uh, different, very well-known uh, voice teachers um, about, about um techniques and and approaches and and marketing and all that stuff for for why someone might switch and then what to do once they do make that switch so it was it was about as fun as a dissertation could be (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome so what were the signs for you and we'll get into we'll get into some more um like music teacher classroom stuff but just for anyone listening who's like oh that's that i've never heard of of a fock being 
like something that's not like your voice teacher tells you what it is. And then you're set with that identity for the rest of your life. So, so what were the signs for you that, um, a change of identity was, was coming up? Yeah. I like the way that you put that, a change of identity. Cause I think that that's a lot of what it feels like. And then it can, it can almost kind of send you into a crisis when that happens in your life. But yeah, Fach is basically voice part, right? And in the classical music world, especially it's really important. It's a, it's an important signifier. Um, of, of your voice type, basically when you audition for different roles, um, you audition for mezzo-soprano roles or you audition for soprano roles or tenor or baritone or whatever. Um, and it kind of narrows down um, what kind of characters you play, what kind of solos you might perform at the symphony. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I was a soprano um, and a couple of those signifiers, um, as I got into my late 20s, I felt that um, those that higher tessitura, so kind of where my voice hung out was very uncomfortable. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, even all during my practice, uh, even undergrad and my master's, it just never really felt settled. I felt like I was mm. almost like a failed soprano. I feel like I felt like I couldn't ever really hang out there and be comfortable. And I thought something was wrong with me, even though I spent hours and hours in the practice room. Yeah. And so for me, um, I started studying with a new teacher in my doctorate, uh, Dr. Melissa Maldi, who is, is one of my mentors. She's amazing. And she she's into body mapping. She really knows the voice. And so the first lesson I actually had with her, she suggested, you know, she was like, have you ever tried being a mezzo soprano? And I was shocked. <laughs> I was like, what, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm singing uh, with some of these, you know, professional gigs as a soprano. And uh, basically, I, I continued to study with her. And she really helped me settle my technique. And um, in auditions, and even in professional performances, people were asking me if I was a mezzo soprano, even though I was still singing a soprano. And, you know, my voice was just starting to really fill out and get, um, have this deeper, richer, easier tone, especially in my, in my middle. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I ended up, uh, taking a few different coachings, getting a few different second, second opinions from others. And they all kind of unanimously agreed that, yeah, this would be a really great switch for you. Um, it's especially, uh, without getting too much in the weeds, having to do with marketing, it, it made mm -hmm. a lot of sense. There's less mezzo sopranos in the world. Um, a lot of times mezzo sopranos play young strapping men and I'm, I just happen to be a little tall so I can be taller and, and, you know, tower over the, the soprano a lot of times. <laughs> so that can be helpful. Um, but yeah, when I started, when, I'm, when I made that switch, it just, it really finally felt like I was home. I fell in love mm -hmm. with the repertoire. I didn't have to die a lot and be in love all the time. I got to be funny. I got to be like the comic relief and, uh -huh. uh, and yeah, it, it just, it felt like I was home, which is interesting because when I interviewed, um, people for my dissertation, uh, that was kind of a recurring theme. I heard that, mm -hmm. that line over and over from people that had made that switch. So it's, I think it's just about finding your authentic voice and, and realizing that everyone's vocal anatomy is different. And mm. you know, even though you might start out as soprano, a lot of us start out as soprano because we're strong singers. And um, and you know, in, in choir in high school, they want those those singers, you know, ringing out the melody. Mm. And so then it can get a little confusing later in life when you have to make that switch. But plenty of people have done it and plenty of people have had success with that. And the opposite is true as well, but I really focused on the people that had done it and, and found success. So yeah, yeah that's the, that's the medium length story. Of that's that awesome. Experience. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, and I'm also thinking, um, you know, if someone was like an instrumental major, you know, in, in mm -hmm. college, the last voice experience they might've had would have been like when they were 19 years old in Absolutely. like a, a voice studio. Right. And that's just, right. it's way too young. It's way too young to tell. Absolutely. I think, I think a lot of times we classify very early and sometimes that can be detrimental to, you know, the voice and just, it, it does when you have to switch all of a sudden cause this identity crisis, of course, um, being, uh, a female singer, you, you also go through a lot of hormonal changes with hormonal changes, which I did not, you know, get into a lot in my dissertation, but that can also cause some changes of voice type. You might feel a little mm -hmm. bit more comfortable singing a lower voice type where when you were younger, that high stuff was, was super easy. Yeah. And just so we have a sense of what we're talking about here, Caitlin, um, when you, when you describe like a lower voice type, can mm -hmm. you give us, and, and you're talking about just like middle tessitura, middle range or so, what are we, what pitches are we kind of hanging out in for that? Just so we're, we're all thinking the same. Yeah. So it's interesting. Another, yeah, thank you for asking that. That's, an, that's, um, another thing that's, that's quite interesting is because 
So I'm going to, I'm talking from the classical solo world, which is a little bit different from choral, right? In, yep. in choir, you have uh, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and then you have soprano one and two, you have alto one and two. Um, in the solo world, uh, I'll just stick with the higher voice types. You have soprano, mezzo, soprano, contralto. That's kind of the, the general um, um, place we're talking about. Now, as far as range, the range actually does not vary a lot between those voice types. Um, maybe a little bit, maybe a few pitches, but it's really, uh, it's really more based on a lot of different factors, including tessitura, including where your passaggio is, where your turn is, like where you want to switch from head to chest voice. And then there's mm -hmm. some, some other passaggios up, up top around uh, F, E, F, uh, E5, E F5, yep. G5, around that area. Um, so just based on where your voice uh, wants to hang out, that kind of can determine um, what kind of voice type you are, but as far as range, it's not, it's not very different. Um, when you're, when you're thinking soprano in the classical mm -hmm. solo world, that kind of matches with maybe like the first soprano range in a choir. And then when you're thinking about mezzo soprano, that's going to match more with that second soprano, um, alto, uh, alto one range. And then, mm -hmm. um, and then contralto is going to match more with that alto two range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you mentioned a couple important terms that I think we we interact with a lot, right. but we don't always attach it to a, an Italian verbiage, right? Because it's not it's is very unnecessary to to go around the, the world thinking about your passaggio all the time, right? Absolutely. But <laughs> well, for, for some people, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> for yeah. for us muggles, Caitlin, not, not oh those gosh. of us in in the opera world. Um, but but if I'm singing throughout the day and I notice that there's a place where my voice is like kind of cracking a lot, or it's hard for me to keep the same like consistent tone as I'm singing a song can you talk to me about um passaggio and then that would kind of lead into tessitura a little bit but but help me think about sure. going through through the world experiencing these things but not always having the verbiage yeah okay so um let's see how how well i can describe this uh i'll leave these terms so we have yes we have passaggio that's where um, basically from an anatomical level and from an acoustic level, there's a switch. Of course, mm. I'm not going to go, go into the weeds. You can, you can read about this, but just simply you'll feel that if you yodel, if you cry, right. Oh, that's your, that's your passaggio. That's where, that's where that transition happens from chest voice to, you can either think about it from chest voice head to head voice or chest voice to mixed voice, whatever you mm. want to think about. Um, so basically people's passaggios are very close um but everyone's is in a little bit different place and um and kind of working through that passaggio working through that transition um can include things like trying to bring your head voice down a little bit lower um and then if you're working on more of those belt styles it can include bringing chest up maybe a little bit higher um uh Although again, you can you can argue all of these things, and uh, yeah, that's just it's something to be aware of because basically, um, tessitura. Let's go to that word is where your voice likes to hang out. Those pitches that your voice just feels really comfortable. Feels like home. Yeah. It feels like home exactly, and typically that is not around your passaggio. Typically, that is in a place where your voice feels really really settled. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's really important to kind of experience where your passaggio is, both that lower and the upper that I mentioned, the first passaggio that, between that chest and head voice or chest and mix. And then that second passaggio, which is around mixed, the transition kind of between mixed voice and head voice, which as I said, is kind of at the top of the staff for, uh, for female singers. Um, and so, yeah, it's important to be aware of where those places are because you'll find that you are going to be comfortable singing not in those places. Of course, you want to go through vocal training so mm -hmm. those places become very easy, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or you know, work on um, uh, vocal warm ups to, to make those places very easy. We can get into this later, but you know, SOVT, semi occluded vocal tract exercises are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful for both finding where your passaggio is and mm -hmm. for um, and for vocal training around that area, those two areas, so that it becomes very comfortable for you. So mm -hmm. even if it's not comfortable now it can become comfortable, but it just might not start out that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tell me what you, you talked about a mixed voice 
if I'm if I'm wondering if uh, maybe I need to find some extra vocal training or I need to kind of think through uh, how I'm approaching my voice on a day-to-day basis. Can yeah. you talk to me about what would a, a mixed voice, a healthy mixed voice, what will that feel like? How will yeah. I know if I'm using a healthy voice? Mm, yeah. Okay. So mixed voice, we basically, you are using that right now. I'm using that right now. We use mixed voice naturally every single day. So that's kind of our a lot of people have have trouble finding mixed voice in their singing, mm. but it's I always I approach it anyways from a very speaky place. Mm. So it's what you're used to. A lot of times there are exceptions to that, of course. Um, but um, what does it feel like? It should feel very natural. It should feel very easy. Um, now, when we're talking about people who teach all day you can get fatigued around that, that area of your voice. Um, so there, yeah, there are definitely methods that you can use to make things feel easier there. Um, I like to, I, I like to just think, um, using a lot more flow in my sound. So our language, mm. American English is very percussive. There's a lot of stops and starts, right? Mm -hmm. And that can make your voice very tired. So even just thinking a little bit more flow, but being in that really natural part of your voice, that very speaky part of your voice can be a, a helpful tool um, for, for hanging out there. So yeah, I don't know if there's anything special. It should just feel easy and natural and authentic and um, like you're not growling, but also not like you're, you don't have to feel like you're putting anything on Necessary. Mm. That's a beautiful way to describe it, flow. Um, and and you're totally right. Like when we speak, we tend to speak kind of like this, right? Yeah. But if I think about staying on the voice and yeah. making sure that like everything, like the faucet is turned on and like my, Ooh, my yeah. speaking voice just comes naturally like that. I notice a lot of times, Caitlin, if I'm like doing a lot of podcasting or like speaking, whatever I tend to, and this is kind of moving away from mixed voice. Um, but I tend to like, after a while I go like this and I'm like, oh, and I have like a yeah. bunch of tension, like in, in the back of my jaw and right. I know it's my tongue. Right. And then yeah. if I go back and I listen or I watch, it's like my voice sounds like so tense and, and right. like tinny. Right. But I know that it's because I'm not, um, using what you describe as like a flow of the voice. So we can go two different directions here. We can talk about, um, some of the problems that I experience. And a lot of people experience with tongue tension, back of jaw tension, just mm -hmm. like regular day-to-day -day use. Um, yeah. or we can talk about kind of bringing the mixed voice, um, like looking at kind of a level above that into what we might call like a singing voice, um, or a head voice or something like that. So which direction would you sure. like to well, go? Let's, let's do the first one, uh, for now. And then maybe we can get into the why of it later. Mm. Okay. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. So, well, tell me, I would love to hear a little bit more about what you experience. What do you, what, so tell me a little bit more about the, how does your voice feel tired? What are, because, because you're, you're kind of the professional in this situation that's, that's experiencing this on a daily level and are, are going to know a little bit more about how your listeners are experiencing this as well. Sure. So I'll speak for me and then maybe we can turn me into like a hypothetical person as well. Sure. Um, so for me, a lot of times when I'm speaking and I get like excited about what I'm talking about, I know that I stop breathing or if I'm in like a stressful situation, like in the classroom, there's a lot of stuff going on yes. at once. And like in an active music room, we want a lot of things going on at once, but sometimes it feels like I'm kind of like holding my body. Right. And, and not um, like <sighs> letting, right. letting my gut hang out, so to speak, <laughs> to, to right. actually, to actually breathe and have some sort of release of the abdominal area. And so, so I know that that also plays a part in some physical tension that I can feel in the mm. back of my jaw. And I could, I, I could point to it, Caitlin, and tell you like this right here, I can feel it here. And then also yeah. kind of like base of my tongue kind yes. of, kind of yeah. area. And so yeah. if I don't take a conscious moment to actually exhale fully and then actually inhale low, and then release that mm -hmm. as well. Um, mm -hmm. My, I don't, I don't lose my voice very often, but that, but I, I did in, in my undergrad um, just from sheer use. But now I notice that uh, my voice becomes less and less pleasant to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, you're like, oh gosh, people have to listen, listen to this. So, so um, kind of dissect some of that for me, Caitlin, help me out. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to put this out there that if you are experiencing trouble with your voice, you can go to a voice teacher, but I would, I would, uh, 
really encourage you to see a, a voice professional, a laryngologist specifically, um, which is a little harder to find than, than an ENT. An ENT specializes in ear, nose, and throat, and a laryngologist is gonna is going to specialize in in the voice box. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're using the word larynx. So let's talk about just very very quickly some some vocal anatomy yes. like when we look at my pharynx all all together now you're talking about my larynx so yes, so help yeah, me yeah. out here layman's terms your larynx is your is your voice box it's where your vocal folds are are located where they're housed um yeah so th that easy enough so that's that's it's um your adam's apple if you can actually see kind of where that is and a lot of people um so yeah a laryngologist will specialize in specifically that region um yeah so if you are having trouble go see a laryngologist um, i always tell my students that are worried about that either they're going to tell you that um everything is okay and that's going to give you peace of mind or they're going to tell you yes there's something you need to work on or some things that might look suspicious and mm. then you know and then you can treat it and then you know you might they might refer you to a speech language pathologist and you do some some therapy um but I think there's a lot of fear surrounding that kind of stuff and you're not alone if you're feeling that fear it's totally normal but i think we we a lot of times can stigmatize vocal in injury and a lot of people deal with this and a lot of most most people almost everyone recovers from it so it's not this thing that you know that you're gonna it's not deal a character with. flaw it's not a character flaw yeah exactly it's not a morality issue yeah um Plenty of people struggle with that. So first of all, if you're really having vocal trouble, go see go see a medical professional. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, your your voice teacher can help you too. Um, some of the things, yeah, that that you're describing, if if I had someone that came in and brought those things to me, um, yes, your voice is part of you. Your whole body is your instrument, right? So you were talking about you feel yourself kind of locking out sometimes. So I love, 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 love to start with body work. And I know a lot of uh, voice teachers love to start with body work. So um, just kind of coming back to what your body does naturally, finding that balance. Um, you know, people work on Alexander Technique. Um, my uh, Dr. Melissa Maldi, who's one of my mentors, like I said, she's a body mapper. So I kind of come um, from, from that perspective which means just basically knowing how your body works and then just letting it do what it does naturally just knowing that you can you stand up you breathe every day you sit down every day mm -hmm. so not doing anything weird when you're when you're singing or when you're speaking in front of a crowd instead you're just using what your body does naturally because a lot of times we recruit all these additional muscles that we don't really need um, mm -hmm. situations um, so yeah, just a lot of body work, feeling like you're really flexible, walking around, speaking, singing. Um, I like to think about having um, a really flexible rib cage, trying to move my rib cage in all different directions when I'm speaking, mm. when I'm breathing in. A lot of people like bouncing up and down on an exercise ball to kind of help find that release. Um, if you don't have an exercise ball, you can just do um, uh, something called uh, <laughs> monkey, where you, you just bend at your knees and your hip joints and kind of ragdoll uh -huh. the top of your body and just bounce. Um, so just really feeling like you you have that release and that naturalness in your body mm. I think is a great first step. Um, yeah, and then um, uh, another thing, uh, this is in no particular order, but uh, yeah. you know, I always do encourage people if possible to use the tools that you have so if there is an option for amplification at your school if your school will cover that even if they want won't if there's a cheap way to amplify your voice electronically hmm. do that especially if you have a large class you know i think a lot of us try to be heroes and we're like oh we don't need to use that don't do that we have these resources available to us and it's going to save your voice if you use those things right hmm. there's no shame in using amplification um especially you know you want to you want longevity you want to protect your voice if you're a voice professional mm -hmm. um, and i talk to a lot of teachers that teach all day and then they go try to sing in community choirs or symphony choruses and they're so tired afterwards yeah. so yeah. anything you can do to lessen or lighten the load um, can be really helpful in fact one of my um colleagues dr Teresa um brancaccio she's uh uh she um is working on this app called Singer Savvy um, that records basically how much vocal usage you use um, each day. And um, 
she she kind of talks about this in terms of a vocal budget. We all have wow. a certain vocal budget every single day. Now, everyone's could be a little bit different. Sure. Um, it can depend on your training. Are you singing every day? Are you not singing every day? Are you being conscious of this? But there are certain activities like, for instance, if you're practicing belting, if that's something that you're working on, that's going to be a really high budget activity. If yeah. you're yelling at a class of kids all day, that's going to be a really high budget activity. If you're talking on an airplane, high vocal budget activity, right? So um, so those things are going to take a lot of it out of you. And then you might have, you know, lower things like, um, you know, humming is a pretty low, low budget activity a lot of times. Um, maybe talking to, to a friend. Um, and, and close proximity is a low vocal budget activity, but just realizing that you only have a little bit each day. And so how are you going to use that? If you know mm -hmm. you have a rehearsal that night, being conscious of that and being like, okay, I know that I have to teach my choir of a hundred kids. And I know I have a community choir rehearsal tonight. How am I going to manage my vocal budget today? That might mean that I need to eat lunch by myself today and not talk to my colleagues, right? That might mean that I need to spend actually a little bit of extra time warming down after mm -hmm. after teaching my hundred you know plus choir yeah. um which those warm downs i can talk about those later if you want but those sobts i mentioned earlier like humming like straw work so so great and that was a game changer for me when i found myself losing my voice a lot in professional choir gigs starting to warm down um, with those exercises was was really really helpful other things that can help are, I love doing jaw massages to mm -hmm. kind of become more conscious of that. So for me, you know, a lot of times when I start warming up um, in my singing, I'll, I'll be giving myself a little jaw massages. So a way that I like to do that is to clench my jaw, find that muscle that pops out, that's your masseter mm -hmm. muscle. And um, a lot of people, this will be a muscle they tense a lot uh, when they sing. So just giving that a little massage, like with your index finger, not really mm -hmm. hurting yourself, but just bringing some awareness there. That's a great example of a muscle that we mm -hmm. all incorporate that probably we don't need to incorporate as much when we're singing and teaching. We can really release that and make yeah. all the sounds that we need to um, with, with the rest of our articulators. Um, so yeah, that's a great example of a muscle that a lot of us recruit. And then another thing, you can look up YouTube videos of this um, for more information, but a lot of people encourage laryngeal massages. I know my mm -hmm. students that go to speech language pathologists, um, they'll, they'll a lot of times be assigned uh, laryngeal massages. Um, and that's just, a, just simply massaging lightly around your, your larynx, your voice box that we mm -hmm. talked about earlier, because those yep. muscles can come in and want to try to help us when, again, we don't really need those um, muscles as much as we think we do um, a lot of times. Um, yes, that is where I'm going to start. Should I expound on any of that? Or is any, how's, how, how are you doing over there? <laughs> I love it. I love all okay. of that. Yes. Sometimes <laughs> I'm singing and just like a very, it's like a, a little children's melody. And it's just like, what is happening back yes. here? Like we don't need to recruit like all this oomph. Right? right. And so what you're talking about, just like a very simple you can, and I can even like not even touch the sides of my jaw. I can just like hover my hands here and just like the mm -hmm. presence of like my body, knowing that my body has taken care of my body yes. and I don't need every part of my body to give like 30 million percent right here. Right. Exactly. But I can feel, I can feel like tinting it up. Oh, ah, ah. like I can feel the difference. Right? Just, just a release in the back of the jaw. Yeah. That's huge. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I, I love I love how you put that. Like your your body is helping your body, right? Your body knows <laughs> exactly what to do, and that's what we keep coming back to. It's it's hopefully going back to a very natural um, natural place. Another thing I like to think about, speaking of the jaw too, is that that mandible, that bone mm -hmm. is is unattached to your skull, right? It's a yeah. different bone. So yeah. for me, just thinking about that bone, just like hanging there. Uh -huh. unattached from my skull can be really, really helpful just as a kind of a cue that I might want to think about if I find myself really tensing that. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, I love how you put that. Exactly. Yeah. And when I, and when I do release that, uh, like the phrase that I think about is like your molars don't need to be on top of your molar, like your molars don't need to be touching. Right. Like let's, let's release those molars. Right. Exactly. And then the, and that's when I feel like so much more resonance in like physically sure. in my skull. Right. Um, and, 
And that's when things feel a lot more free and a lot more natural. And then Caitlin, I'm just like a nicer person because I'm not, <laughs> right? I'm yeah. not as tense, you know, yeah. but, but if I don't have the, the presence of mind to notice, like my body is really trying to take over for my body and, and something's happening here that, that makes me want to like kick every part of me into like this fight flight overdrive, you know, and it's not beneficial to, to anyone. Right. And I think when I'm talking to music professionals, when I'm talking to music students about this, it comes from a good place. We are probably all overachievers in this profession. Like we love what we do. We want to do the best we can. And so we just feel like we have to try so hard all the time and recruit all of those muscles. And yeah. we have to be really feeling like we're working all the time. Right. Yeah. And, and so letting go of that can be really challenging because we might not feel like we're working as hard as we need to. Mm -hmm. Um, so I mean, I think anything you can do, um, so a great thing to do for this is, uh, you've probably heard of habit stacking before. I don't know if you've heard of this, but, but yeah, it's putting, making, if you're trying to do something new, stacking it on top of a habit you already have. So an example, mm -hmm. um, I remember that my voice teacher gave me, if you're trying to work, let's pretend like you're trying to work on, uh, releasing your jaw. So maybe every single morning when you're brushing your teeth, you're, you're like, okay, every single morning when I brush my teeth, I'm going to just check in with my jaw and see if I can release it while I'm brushing my teeth. Or yeah. if you are about to teach, maybe you could have it stack uh, awareness of your jaw with something you do right before you teach so that you're right. like, okay, I'm just going to take like 10 seconds to check in with my body every time that I fill up my coffee, like right before I go in my classroom or something like right, that. Or if right. you have some kind of designated break in the middle of your rehearsal, mm -hmm. somehow habit stacking that um, with with just building that awareness of, of that inclusive awareness in your body to make sure that you're you're releasing all of those things uh, that we just talked about. Um, that can be a really, really helpful tool to just start bringing this to the, the forefront of your mind. Well, and, and to that end, like if we're, if we are music teachers and we are teaching children how to use their voices, then what a great thing just to include, you know, what I, what I find is that often I'll be leading like stretches or something like that. And I'm like going through the motions of stretching, but I'm not actually breathing. Right. Like, like I'm so tense, but I'm trying to coach all of these young people around me to like, to, to, to breathe and do all of that. So like a note in your lesson plan yeah. that says like, actually breathe. <laughs> yeah. I remember, Oh gosh. I remember in, I, it must've been actually at, uh, where we went to college in choir. I remember one time someone was like, you know, when you do choral warmups, you should actually use all of your technique just like you do in lessons. And I was like, Oh, <gasps> What? Fascinating. I know. It was like mind blowing to me. I was like, oh yeah, I use that flow phonation. I use my breath. Like I use it. Mm -hmm. I should just, I should be doing exactly the same things I'm doing when I'm taking care of my voice. And yeah, sometimes we just need to remember that. It's so funny. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so you talked to me about my jaw and you've helped me out with my jaw. And so now my jaw tension is gone forever because you've given me some habit stacking wow, things forever. to do. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> um, and so now when I brush my teeth, it's all, it's like a very Zen relaxing moment. And then I can go through the rest of my day like that. So now can you help me with my tongue? Let's talk about my tongue because people might not, um, think about how present the tongue is in our, our vocal, um, process, or maybe you disagree with that. Right. No, I don't disagree. I, I, I definitely agree with that. But yeah, the tongue is really important. It's a great articulator. You can you all of the all of the words we create, all of the um, vowels we make, we make them with the shape of our tongue. So it's a really helpful articulator. Could you say that again? Mm -hmm. That we all create the, our vowels with our tongue and yes. not with like yes. the outside of, of our mouth? Exactly. I mean, yes, the outside of your mouth can be can be useful now, especially when you're doing O's and O's, you want to round those lips. But yes, that's actually, that's a that is so much fun to play with in lessons. A lot of times people again, they want to over incorporate those muscles around the jaw um, to create those vowels. But the the muscle, the articulator, the main articulator um, that that makes that forms vowels is the tongue. So you can you can experiment with that with your E vowel, for instance, you can make an E vowel and have your mouth really closed. E, 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 or you can say that same vowel, you can drop that jaw, as long as your tongue is in that E position, which is a really arched position, then you're going to hear an E. 
E, 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 E. So I'm dropping my jaw and I'm still getting an E because I have my tongue in that E shape. Yeah, so that's a really fun thing to play with, um, especially if you're trying to release jaw tension, realizing that your jaw can do whatever it wants to do as long as your tongue's in that E position or whatever, we're going to make that that sound. Yeah, I want to interrupt just to say that uh, when I found that out, that changed everything for me right? because mm -hmm. I was trying to be like the best singer that I could. So in awe was like right. this, right? Like, right? like when you go yeah. to the dentist and the oh always looked like this, right? But when I when I let go of what the uniform vowel shape needs to look like on the outside and mm -hmm. started thinking about how it feels and how it sounds instead. Yeah. And and again, like that it's it's the jaw, it's the pivoting or the, the tongue, it's like the pivoting and the the movement of the tongue in the base, right? Yes. Um, yes. That, that was a, a huge breakthrough for me. Yeah. And it's yeah. so obvious, but it was not obvious for me, which is right, why right. I, you know, want to hang out on it for a second. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. And I think that in choir, yeah, we have, we have students that just want to please and want to, and they want, they want to be there and they're so excited to be there. So you tell them to make an awe vowel and they're going to over open their jaw. They're going to make yeah. the best awe sound that you've, like the awe vowel that you've ever seen. Um, but yeah, I think being, I really like to bring attention to everyone is made differently. Everyone looks differently. So we're not going to all look the same when we sing. Um, and, and we also, if I'm telling my choir or my students, if I'm saying, Hey, I need a better awe vowel, you also have to be really, you have to really work with your singers to make sure they know it, it's always going to be the overachievers that take that and they'll be like, and they'll be like, Oh, I need to make, I need to make my awe vowel even, yeah, even <laughs> bigger and, you know, drop my jaw even more until their jaw pops out of place. But right. just making sure that they know that it should always be natural. Um, and, and maybe, you know, you're not talking to those students at that time. Some of you are doing really well with this right now. Um, I'm not talking to everybody, but let's just check in and make sure that everyone's tongue is in, is in that awe position mm -hmm. and, you know, make sure everyone's feeling really nice and natural on this all or whatever, you know, whatever, yeah. however you yeah. want to translate it into your own teaching. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a really, really good point. And I agree. That was a big, big change for me too. When, when I realized that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I know that the, the base of my tongue has a lot to do with number one, <laughs> tension and just vocal production, but also the, that all of the sounds that I make, you said are from my tongue. So any, anything that you can do, Caitlin, to help me with tongue tension, and I'm going to like drop, um, drop a little Easter egg for everyone to go scroll through Caitlin's Instagram. And you have a yeah. post from like a long time ago oh, I do, with yeah. some tongue, with some totally. tongue exercises. And I was like, mm. yes, yes. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. this is, this is like, the the most beautiful act of self care that you can do is like oh. releasing the base of the tongue, you <laughs> yes, know. So exactly. so help me out help me out with this. Yeah. So um, okay. So I like to think of the tongue like a water balloon. It's huge. If you ever look at um, what it actually looks like, how big the muscle is, it's very large, um, and it goes way further back than a lot of people realize, um, and kind of wraps around under under mm -hmm. where the, the tongue that you see is. Um, so. Uh, basically, if you retract that tongue, okay, it all that mass has to go somewhere. So it's like poking a water balloon, all that mass is going to go somewhere. And a lot mm -hmm. of times it goes straight to the back of your throat. And that's right, you get all that tension, you feel like kind of that bunching up. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's great to bring awareness to that, because you might find if you start to realize that you're retracting that tongue, oh, that's why I'm feeling all that tension. That's why I'm starting to get hoarse because I'm overusing this muscle. When again, yeah. I don't really need to use this as much, right? Or I need to kind of put it in a position that's going to be a little bit more natural for me. So yeah, a lot of people have different ways to approach this. You know, one just kind of general general rule just to kind of check in with is seeing if you can keep the tip of your tongue right behind your bottom teeth most of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's going to kind of keep your tongue out of the back of your throat. Um, so that's what I like checking in with. Um, as far as um, exercises for this, just it's, yeah, it's just building awareness. So um, I'm trying to remember some of those exercises that I had when, in Victoria's, uh, video, <laughs> <laughs> my video that Victoria watched, but, um, one, one is just kind of, uh, humming around with your tongue, just lightly placed over your bottom lip. Mm -hmm. And you might find as you kind of explore that, try, you know, start out in middle voice always, but then explore the, the upper end, explore that lower end. And you might feel a lot of times when we do this, what, what we find is as we ascend, mm -hmm, 
mm, that tongue starts to want to pull back in our mouth. And that's just a really good cue. Okay, I'm involving this way more than I need to. I'm just going to keep that released and relaxed and hanging over the, the bottom of my tongue or the bottom mm -hmm. of my lip. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I really like using that one. Um, a lot of people will like to actually do like tongue stretches before they sing, like, like uh, making their tongue go all the way out of their mouth. Uh -huh. Um, just like you would stretch any other muscle and just using that to, to kind of release everything. So making, you know, making a really funny face where your tongue's all the way out and then releasing and then doing yeah. that a few times and just really feeling, feeling that release. That's a good, that's a good way to kind of make sure that that, that muscle is released. Um, there's also one that I like that I think I did in that video where you do a tongue curl. So gosh, this is kind of hard to explain. Maybe you can help me Victoria, but where you <laughs> roll your tongue. So uh -huh. that the tip of your tongue is again, right, right kind of at your bottom teeth. And then you mm -hmm. stick the um, blade oh, of yes. your tongue, the middle uh -huh. of your tongue out between your teeth. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then you hum around there. Mm -hmm. You got to leave some space right on the edge of the, right on the edge of your tongue on both mm -hmm. um, sides to kind of let some of that sound get out. Hey. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So that's a really good exercise again to just kind of explore and be like, okay, let's try to now after I do middle voice, let's explore down below. Let's explore up top and see if there's any place where my tongue's wanting to retract a little bit. And then just, um, you know, gently not forcing yeah. yourself to stick your tongue out, but gently reminding yourself that, okay, I actually don't need to use as many of these muscles as I think I do. Let's see if I can release that and see what happens. Um, if I bring my, my range a little bit higher. Um, yeah. So those are just some, some kind of go-tos um, that I use. A lot of people will do like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like they'll literally sing with their tongue out, um, yeah. hanging over their bottom lip. And uh -huh. it's the same kind of idea. Just seeing if you can, you can release some of uh, those muscles that maybe you don't need to use as much. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking about so much of the, um, like we call it elemental music, but like very simple folk music that is intended for children in kind of like a recreational setting. Those songs have a small enough range and they're short enough that a lot of the songs that we use just as elementary music teachers, yes. those are great things just to, to sing with your tongue straight out. And like, can you sing you whatever, you know, snail, yeah. snail song with your tongue straight out? And so often, Caitlin, I think that, um, again, my hand, my hand is up along with everyone else, but, um, I don't notice that I've had all of this tension until I do something to release the tension. And then I'm like, good golly, Miss Molly, have I been walking right. around like, <laughs> yeah, like just a, a ball of stress? I had no idea. Yeah. And you know, you were in such a neat position, um, as a music teacher, I think we forget a lot of times again with good intentions, but, but we, we don't remember that the the kids, the students, they're going to mirror whatever we're doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if we are again, we are we have that energy, we're trying hard, we're having fun. A lot of times, you know, like you said, a lot of times we'll get all that tension, but realizing that okay, I, I know I do this. I get in front of kids and I get so excited. I love being like it feels like you're on stage. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But then, yeah, checking what happens sometimes, <laughs> like you, you are, you are more in the classroom than I am, but I notice, for instance, that all the energy that I have starts to reflect in them. And then sometimes we get crazy and we, and this eruption yep. happens and I'm like, oh gosh, yep. I need to bring my energy a little bit more, like a little bit down here. So everyone is calm, but I think mm. it's the same thing, right? When you, when you're carrying that, all that tension in the classroom, those kids are watching you and whether they know it or not, they're going to mirror that. So just yeah. Kind of making sure that whatever you're doing, that's that is what you want those students to be learning. You want them to be mm -hmm. learning that they, they release the jaw. You don't have to describe that to them. Just show them, and they're gonna they're gonna mirror what you're doing. Yeah, and even just to yes and that about like our our actual job as the vocal model in the room mm -hmm. is to to teach them that they can release the jaw. But then in order for them to know that they need to release the jaw, what we're actually teaching is like a body awareness and yes. like a self a self awareness, right? You talked about right. our voice is all of us, right? So what a beautiful gift to to be able to give. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I like the piece of that. Mm -hmm. So talk to me, Caitlin, just as we're wrapping up here, let's say that someone has been in the classroom for a couple weeks now and we're starting to feel like when we sing, our voice isn't coming out like exactly how we would expect. And maybe there are times like our voice is going in and out just a little bit, or we feel like maybe kind of like husky or maybe we have like a, a dry throat and we think to ourselves, I think I might be losing my voice a little bit here in the yeah. first weeks of school. So tell me, um, give me like a, um, 
a plan that we can follow if, if we notice that we're having some vocal fatigue a couple weeks into the year? Yeah. So when I'm going to come at this from the perspective of, um, I, I work with a lot of college students at Colorado Mesa and, uh, you know, they'll come in and after a few weeks of singing, they're, they're in choir rehearsals all the time. They're yep. in voice lessons. They're working jobs after school. Like they're yep. doing a lot with their voice. And yes, they'll find, they come in and they start losing their voice. And the first thing I always tell them is, you know, you are the only one responsible for your voice. Woo! You know, like we, we are like, oh, well, my teacher will take care of this or my choir director will know that I'm overusing my voice or my people at work will know that I'm yep. overusing my voice. They're, they are, they are, it is not their responsibility. <laughs> your vocal health is not their responsibility. It's your wow. responsibility. And, and just, I, I think it took me a long time to learn that. Like I had to, again, when I was singing in professional choirs and I was singing soprano, I was singing all that straight tone floaty stuff for like six hours a day. And then I would mm -hmm. go out and have dinner with friends and I would lose my voice. And I'm like, what's going on? Everyone else can do it. Why can't I do it? Because yeah. I wasn't being responsible with the way that I was for my own vocal health, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just think that's really important to, to be aware of. And also it's unfair because some people can do that and not lose their voice and some people can't and you just have to figure out where you are in in this journey mm -hmm. um so uh yeah that's the first thing and then just exactly what we were talking about some of these things um some of these exercises the body awareness is just huge so starting with that really i i think that habit stacking thing can be a great place to start if you're struggling to remember that um yeah that body awareness um that's a great place to start and then um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, a game, another game changer for me was the SOVT exercises. So semi occluded vocal tract exercises, semi occluded just means that some opening is semi closed, some opening is semi closed where that air and where that sound is coming out. So, um, a simple semi occluded vocal tract exercise example is a hum, because when you hum, your sound is coming out your nose. So that's a smaller opening than your mouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you can read about this if you want, but basically in layman's terms, when you use these exercises, some of the, I, I hope, it, listen, vocal pedagogy colleagues, if you're listening and you're like, this is not correct at all, you can call me or whatever. <laughs> but as I understand it, when you use this exercise, some of the sound waves, some of the energy is reflected, is reflected back down into your vocal tract. And it kind sure. of almost gives your vocal cords a little massage. It kind of reminds them, okay, this is how you come together um, mm. all the way in an efficient manner. Mm -hmm. And again, we're just going back to that naturalness. That's all yeah. it does. It kind of reminds us how our vocal, it reminds your body how your vocal folds are supposed to be functioning. It makes them function a little bit more efficiently, um, that baseline efficiency. So, uh, I, when I started using, if you notice, like for instance, if you're, if you're singing a high note, you, you know, you are, um, you have a full day of teaching and then you go back to your, your home, your apartment or your office, whatever. And you try to go, ooh, ooh, you try to do, you sing a high note, but then you realize that there, like, you, there's like a little space between, like you can't phonate yes. right away. Yes. Ooh, ooh, you might realize that's happening. Yeah. Your vocal folds are not coming together all the way. They, they forgot, <laughs> right? You've kind of overused something um, and they just need a little reminder. They need a little massage. They need a little love. So great ways to, to kind of, this is not a cure-all. This is not like, okay, now my vocal budget is back at 100%. This is not that. But this is just a little reminder, a little, um, a little uh, love that you can give your vocal cords at the end, vocal folds at the end of a, um, a long day. So yeah, hums are great for this. Singing through a straw is my personal favorite for this. So if you have a straw, um, you sing through it, you make sure you can plug your nose, make sure that your sound's not coming through your nose. A lot of people will put a straw in their mouth and try to sing through it and then actually just kind of hum, make yeah. all their sound comes out your nose. So make sure you're not yeah. doing that. But just again, starting in the middle and then getting curious and kind of going up a little bit higher, Woo, doing some slides. Um, that can be great. And then in G's, hmm. Mm -hmm. That's basically humming. Uh, all your sounds coming out your nose, but your mouth is open, which I love because again, that yeah. can bring that jaw awareness um, yep. in. And um, and doing this for like, you do not have to kill yourself on this. It's like two to five minutes after a rehearsal. 
I loved, I keep a straw in all of my choir folders. Um, I keep, I keep them in my car so that when I'm driving home after a rehearsal, I'll just spend mm. a few minutes doing this. And I, I tell you, it makes such a big difference. If you go to a speech language pathologist, a lot of times they'll do this and yeah. you can immediately hear a difference in your voice. If it's mm. like raspy or if it's, it's kind of, if you can't, if you're kind of speaking up here and you can't get your voice to come back down lower, if you've ever had that happen, yeah. that can really help. Um, with that as well. And then, oh, and then another one that I really like is just an extension of that, the straw and water, um, where you do that exact same thing, but you're blowing bubbles. Um, when I went to a speech language pathologist, she gave me this exercise and it was really helpful because when you do that, you want to make sure that you're, you have this consistent, uh, consistent bubble rate that it's not, you know, when you sing higher, it's not going crazy. And when you sing yeah. lower, like it's, you just try to keep that flow phonation we were talking about earlier. So uh -huh. that's just a really tactile way of seeing, am I letting my breath flow or am I stopping and starting it? Am I giving more pressure than I need? Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, that can be another helpful, um, another helpful exercise. Yeah. Those are those, that's kind of where I would start. And if you, again, if you are feeling like something is not right, go see, go see a vocal professional. They're either, you're mm. going to, I know it's scary, but it will put your mind at rest. And I think as vocal professionals doing that every once in a while, anyway, like every few years, it's just yeah. a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So that, that is perfect. Caitlin, you've given us, and, and you even said that we can do some of these in the car on our drive yes. home. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, and before I should say, and if great, the, the best thing you can do is do that on the way there and the way back. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it also kind of like double functions as like a mindfulness exercise, mm -hmm. you know, which is going to improve yeah. your day anyway. So this is, this has been awesome. This has been like so tactile, so um, implementable, but also you're sure. speaking broadly enough that, that it can apply to so many different people with so many different um, vocal backgrounds and everything like that. I know I have, um, I'm going to do the, the straw thing right after this. I'm very, Yay. I am very excited. Yes, yes, <laughs> um, yeah, all right. So I, I gave a, a plug for your Instagram already. Um, give us other other plugs. Where can we find you online? You mentioned that you do some vocal coaching online. So if someone's like, yes, sure. um, the last voice lesson I had was when I was 19 and and I want to hear, hear more. So where can we find you, Caitlin? Yeah, absolutely. So Instagram, yes, I'm there at Caitlin H. Moore, C-A-I-T-L-I-N-H-M-O-O-R-E. Um, yeah, I was really active that, on that during COVID. And then uh, I got this position at Colorado Mesa and Interlochen. And <laughs> I'm a little quieter on there now, but you can absolutely contact me through there. There are videos on there of some of these warm-ups if you want to scroll back through and watch those. Um, yeah. I, I don't mind sharing it all. I think we're, we, we all in the voice community need to help each other, and um, it's a cool community to be a part of. So please take those and use those that's what they're there for. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can reach out to me there. You can reach out to me through, um, my website. Okay. It's Caitlin C A I T L I N Hammond H A M M O N no D more <laughs> R E dot com. Um, and there's contact information, uh, there that you can reach out to me. Uh, if you, if you want a voice lesson, um, I'm kind of full right now, but that's a good problem to have. I'm, but I do have uh, one-off openings every now and then, and I would love, love, love. I love helping, uh, voice professionals with, with this kind of stuff. So please, if you want to talk, if you want to shoot me an email, go for it. Great. All right, Caitlin, thank you, um, so much for your time. This has been Awesome. I'm very excited to do all of these things. And I think um, it'll be very helpful, you know, as this releases a couple weeks into the year. I think um, everyone in their car will be humming along and doing their mm yes. with us and, and everything like that. So thank you um, so much for all of the work you do with all of your students at all of the, the various levels. Very grateful for your time. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me, Victoria.